Good morning, North Park. I'm Joshua, and we're so glad that you're here today. Here's a couple things we want you to know about. This Wednesday night, August 14th, all of our regular activities are kicking back off, and we're super excited. If you have any preschoolers or kids, they're welcome to join us for Cubbies or MP Kids Night. If you're a middle school or high school student, come join us upstairs for worship. The cafe opens at 5.45, so come hang out with us. Worship begins at 6.15. The College Bible Study also meets upstairs in the Calvin Miller Room. It starts at 6.45 and is led by Barry Goggins. We're excited to announce that North Park Choir is back. Meet in the worship room at 6.15 and be ready to sing. The North Park Women's Ministry is launching two new Bible classes this fall. Come this Wednesday to the preview day to decide which one you would like to be a part of. Also this fall, the men's ministry will be kicking off their Bible study in 1 Corinthians. The two co-ed classes this fall include Pastor Bill's Bible study in room 200 and Old Testament survey in room 100. And everyone is invited to eat supper with us at 5 o'clock. Let us know you're coming by making a reservation in the bulletin, on the North Park website, or on the North Park app. There's literally something for everybody on Wednesday, so we hope to see you there. If you need any more information about anything you've heard, feel free to check out the website, download the app, or visit us on social media. Thanks again for joining us today, and let's continue to worship. Numbers. We live by numbers. We track and count and measure everything, and sometimes we think the only numbers that really matter are the big ones. But it's the single digits that make the difference. The Bible says that heaven rejoices with the number one. Yeah, heaven rejoices each time even one person comes to know Jesus. We pastors dream about big numbers, and we should. But a daily focus on one meaningful interaction for Christ, that's the true difference maker. One friend, one family member, one coworker, one person at a time. We wanna see God move in our nation like we have never seen before, but it all starts with one. I've got my one, and now I'm challenging you and your church to join us and to find yours. Because ultimately, the only number that really matters is one. Who's your one? Families. Well, this morning we're going to begin a new series for about four or five weeks called Who's Your One? And this is a series that we are doing in conjunction with hundreds, if not thousands, of other churches uh, across our nation as we think about our great need in our world today for people to come to know Christ. We, uh, you remember that song that we used to sing, People Need the Lord? Well, I can't think of a time where I feel more desperately that people need the Lord than right now. And the only way that people are going to come to know Christ is if we share Christ with them. And so throughout this series, there's a question that we're going to continue to raise with all of us. Who is your one? Who is that one person that God has brought into your life? Maybe a friend, a family member, a classmate, maybe somebody that you work with, that, that you may be the only person in their life that could be that light that leads them to Christ. Who is your one? If we're going to see missions and evangelism in our Jerusalem, which is in America or in our community, it, it requires intentionality from all of us. And so th this is going to be a series that I'm praying is going to result in, in great fruit for the kingdom of God. As we begin the series this morning, I want you to open your Bible with me to John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. We're going to begin talking about inviting others to Christ, inviting others to Jesus uh, as we think about this. You know, often uh, when we think of the number one, we think of it as a small and insignificant number. Remember the old lace potato chip uh, advertising campaign? It said you can't eat just one. And, and that was so true. I never could eat just one uh, Lay's potato chip. And if I go to a Mexican restaurant with, with salsa and chips, I, there's no, I eat not just one ba basket. I eat about four baskets. I'm not even hungry by the time the meal gets there. I'm a chipaholic. I love chips. You can't eat just one cookie. You can't eat just one donut. And yet we often think of that number one is, is insignificant. But the Bible 
doesn't think so. In the Bible, we read about the value of one pearl of great price. One coin that was lost. One sheep that had gone astray. One son that was wayward. The Bible, God, puts great emphasis on every one. I'm a one. I'm one person. You're a one. You're one person. And God loves you. God knows you. God puts great value on you. But even those that are not here this morning, those that are not churchgoers, that are, those that are lost, those that are far away from God, that use His name in vain, that curse Him, mock Him, may not even believe in Him. God puts value on them. God loves that one as much as He loves me. He loves that one that is far away from Him. God puts great value on everyone. This morning, we see in Luke chapter 15, verse 10, that Jesus once said this, There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. That's the value that God places on each one. And so the main idea I want to share with you this morning as we look at uh, some of the very first disciples of Jesus, Andrew and, and uh, Peter, and we're going to see Philip and Nathaniel, how these first disciples, immediately after they come to know Christ, they think about one other person they can invite and bring with them. And so what we're going to learn is that there is great value in leading just one person to Christ. If we could lead just one person to Christ, there's great value. So would you take your Bible and stand with me as we read John 1, verses 35 through 51. Follow along with me in your Bible as I read. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus, and he is calling people to faith, calling them to repent. And then one day he had the opportunity to baptize Jesus. And it says the next day, verse 35, John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, two of the disciples that John the Baptist had that were following him. And he said to those two, Look, behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples of John the Baptist who heard him say this, turned and began to follow Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. And so they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John the Baptist speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip went and found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Our Heavenly Father, 
we thank you for the value of one. Every one of us in this room today is deeply loved by you, more than we could ever imagine. You value every life. And those that are far away from you, oh God, those that are lost and living in sin, you love them and you value them just as much as you do us. God, there is value in every one. God, show us as we go through this study together, who is our one? Who is that one person that we might be the one and only light in their world, the only one that could reach them at this time? God, teach us and challenge us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And so again, the big idea I want to share with you is that there is great value in leading just one person to Christ. Let me ask you this question. Can you name one person in your spiritual journey who has come to Christ through your invite or your witness? Think about it. Is there one person in your, as long as you've known the Lord, as long as you have been saved, in your spiritual journey, is there one person who has come to Christ personally because of your invite or your witness? In other words, someday when you're in heaven, will there be somebody that walks up to you and says, thank you, because if it were not for you, I would not be here. You are the person that led me to Christ. You're the person that brought me to Christ. Well, my prayer is that as a result of this study that we're going to go through, that all of us in this room would have the joy of leading someone to Christ. That someday, if you can't answer that question, yes, that someday you'll be able to say, yes, there's one, and hopefully there'll be many, many more that come to know Christ through us. And so let's think about that this morning. How do we invite others to Christ? Well, there's three things I want to share with you this morning that we see in our text. Number one, it's important for us to have a basic understanding of the gospel. Everybody we read in our text this morning that witnessed to others had a basic understanding of the gospel. And it's important for all of us to have a basic understanding of the most important message in the Bible. The most important message is what we call the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If you go to North Park and you've been here for a long time, I don't see how it would be possible for you not to have a basic understanding of the gospel. Because we talk about it a whole lot. Every Sunday, I either start with it or make a beeline to it toward the end. And we talk about it in our life groups and our D groups and almost everything we do here centers around the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and so we should, as believers, ha have a, a basic understanding of of the gospel. We see in our text that John the Baptist was baptizing and he baptized Jesus and there were two of his disciples that were with him and when he saw Jesus walking he said five words, behold the Lamb of God. And, and that those five words show that he had a basic understanding of the gospel. He knew who Jesus was and he knew that Jesus Christ was the sacrifice that God had sent so that sinners could be saved. John the Baptist knew that every lamb that was sacrificed in the Old Testament merely pointed to the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Christ, who was the one lamb who would die on a cross, shed his blood for the sins of the whole world. And in five brief words, John the Baptist pointed two of his own disciples to Jesus Christ. The simplicity of the gospel is, is what is so beautiful about the gospel. It's so simple that children can learn how to witness. Teenagers can be ardent evangelists. We as adults should be passionate evangelists and witnesses of Jesus Christ because it's so easy to comprehend and understand and know the gospel. And so the two disciples heard him, and they followed Jesus. John the Baptist knew that it was more important for the two disciples that were following him to follow Jesus than it was for them to follow him. He wanted to point them to Jesus. 
He didn't care that they left him. He knew that the most important thing in life was for them to follow Jesus. They followed Jesus, and Jesus turned around and said, what are you guys seeking? I don't think they knew how to answer that. I think they're kind of like, oh, what do we say here? So the only thing they could think of is, Rabbi, where are you staying? You know, we want to come hang out with you. So where are you staying? And Jesus said to them a beautiful invitation. Come and see. Just come. And that invitation is all through the Bible. We'll see that come to Jesus. Come to see. And that's the invitation that we have the joy of giving others. I know for me, the greatest thing that ever happened in my life was the day I came to Jesus. I remember specifically when I came to Jesus, the difference it made. And I have the opportunity to invite others to come and see. Come and taste uh, of the water of life. Come and see that Jesus is good. And it says that they stayed with him for it was the tenth hour. Uh, I think that Andrew and John were the two disciples. John never mentioned himself in his own gospel. Most believe that it was Andrew and John. And John remembered that it was the tenth hour. You know what? why that's significant? You never forget when you met Jesus. Amen? You never forget that. That tenth hour, I mean, he knew that was the moment that he met Jesus. And, and so it's so important for us to have a basic understanding of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God. That we think about the ability of the gospel. Some of you may feel like, well, I'm not a very able witness. I, 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 I don't speak well. I'm shy. I'm introverted. You see, none of that matters. Because it's not your ability as a witness that matters. It's the ability of the gospel. It's the power of the gospel. God will use any tool to share the gospel. Here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In other words, each person, when each person puts their faith in Jesus, the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel. So it doesn't matter how eloquently you share it. It's not your power that leads others to Christ. It's the power of the gospel. So we see the ability of the gospel. We see the simplicity of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, Paul said, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For here's the gospel. Listen, this is the simplicity of it. For I delivered to you, first of importance, what I also received, three things. That Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. That He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day, and according to the Scriptures. That's the beautiful simplicity of the gospel. If somebody said, what is the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose the third day. And, and somebody says, well, what do I have to do? Well, in Acts 20, verse 20 and 21, Paul says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you publicly and house to house, testifying to Jews and to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message of the gospel. The simplicity of it makes it that there's no way that we can't understand the message and how to share it with others. We share with others that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, he rose again the third day, and that we have to repent from our sin and turn to Jesus and we'll be saved. I just shared the gospel with you in what? Ten seconds? And you say, that's it? That is the power of God unto salvation. Every one of us in this room were saved by that message. Amen? And if you were not saved by that message, guess what? You're not saved. I mean, there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. And so we see the ability of the gospel. We see the simplicity of the gospel. And then there's the necessity of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 9, 16, 
the last part of that ver verse, Paul said, necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. In other words, if I have tasted of the sweetness of heaven and God in Jesus Christ, woe is me if I do not share this with others. How can I not share this with others? Necessity. You see, I believe today in heaven. And I believe that I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm a good person, because God knows I'm not. But I have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have been forgiven. And I'm going to go to heaven by the grace of God. I believe that heaven is real. I believe I'm going to live forever with God and Jesus in a place where there's no more sickness or death. I'm excited about that. But just as much as I believe in heaven, I, the same degree I believe there's a place called hell. And just like I believe heaven is a real place, I believe hell is a real place. It's a place where people who are not saved by grace will go and spend eternity separated from God, never meeting God face to face, and, and, and living in a place of torment. And, and really, it's a package deal. I mean, how in the world could we believe in heaven and not believe in hell? Because the same Bible teaches both emphatically so if you say well i don't believe in one well then how do you know the other is true i, I mean if you believe in one you got to believe in the other and if we really believe that how could we not wouldn't it make us unloving mean-spirited people if we have no desire to share the love of jesus with our friends our families our neighbors if we know that it makes that eternal difference in their life here at North Park, we have this tool always available to you. We believe in sharing the gospel so much that we want to help you have a basic understanding of the gospel. And, and this is what we call our evangelism Bible. We have a display out there today, but we usually have these in our cafe every week. You pay for these with your tithes and offerings, and we feel like it is one of the best investments of tithes and offerings we could do is make these available to you. And so if you have somebody that is your one that you want to share Christ with, you can come by any Sunday and grab one of these. You can take it for free. Now, if you want to give a $5 donation to help replenish, you can, but hey, your tithes and offerings already pay for them. What we ask is don't take this home and put it on your shelf, all right? If you're going to take one of these, there's a purpose for it. Use this to share Christ with someone. There are six tabs on the Evangelism Bible, and these six tabs take you through basic verses. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but God demonstrated His great love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We are saved by grace through faith. That if we're going to be saved, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised from the dead, you'll be saved. You can take this Bible and walk through the gospel with someone and, and it, it gives you a basic understanding of the gospel. Take this home and study it, memorize it, know it. Also, we have an armband. I'm wearing my armband today. It has the exact same verses that are in this Bible. You could wear this to school. You could wear this to work. You could wear this... Uh, wherever you go, and someone asks you about it, you can say, hey, I'm glad you asked. Let, let me walk you through these verses. And then what I like, because I can't carry this in my back pocket, it's a little big, I keep it in my car, but I love the card. Same verses, same colors, and you can keep this in your wallet, you can keep this in your purse, and every opportunity you have to share the gospel to be a witness, you can always have these cards with you. They're out there. And, and you should always have these with you to share the gospel. And so not only will these tools help you have a basic understanding of the gospel, but with these, you can use these at any time to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Well, the second thing is we, we must have a genuine concern for the lost. In our heart, we, we must, in, in a heart of love, we, we must care about people who are far away from God. 
not judge them. Our, our job is not to look at them and say, ooh, you're bad. You know, God's the only judge. God's going to take care of judgment. He did not call us to be judges. What did he call us to do? To be witnesses. And so my job is not to judge others, but to share with others the wonderful plan of how God gave his life so that they could be saved. And, and so we see that genuine concern in our text. One of the two that heard John the Baptist speak and who followed Jesus was Andrew. Andrew is one of the twelve disciples. He's one of the lesser known, but he was one of the twelve. And he was the brother to one of the best known disciples, Simon Peter. And what did he, immediately when Andrew met Jesus, what did Andrew do? Immediately, his, he first found his own brother Simon. Many scholars believe the word first implies that John, the writer of the Gospel of John, also went to his brother James, that they both went to their brothers. Andrew went to his brother Simon, five words, we have found the Messiah. Again, five words, basic understanding of the Gospel. He, he knew that there was a Messiah promised from God that would be the Savior of the world. He shared a simple five-word Gospel presentation now, Peter was the stronger, more dominant brother. He was a natural-born leader. I'm sure he was probably a pretty difficult person to witness to if you were Andrew. But yet, he cared so much about his brother, he, he went and shared the gospel with Peter. He brought him to Jesus. Wouldn't it be awesome to bring your brother to Jesus? And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means Peter. So Jesus changed his name from Cephas to Peter, that means rock. The name change is symbolic, and it represents the powerful transformation that Jesus Christ brings to every life. We, as we read the Gospels, we see that transformation in Peter. I mean, he went from being a, a hard-headed, stubborn, selfish individual to a person that God used in a great way. And I believe that when we share the gospel with people, we see that transformation in every life. We see men that are saved, and they become better men. They become better husbands and better fathers, better employees or employers. We see women who are saved, and they become a better woman, a better wife, a better mother. Uh, a, a better uh, lover of other people. We see teenagers saved, and, and God works in their life in incredible ways to lead them toward abundant life and not toward life that destroys them. And we can bring others with us, and because we believe that that transformation is abundant life and eternal life, we should have a desire, a concern for every lost person to be saved. I rejoice when the lost come to Christ. You may remember the story in the Old Testament of Cain and Abel. Cain was jealous of his brother Abel because Abel gave God a greater sacrifice. And you remember the story, Cain is the first murderer in the Bible. He murdered his brother Abel. And, and God later came to Cain. And you remember the question? God, it says, the Lord God came, Genesis 4, chap, gen, chapter 4, verse 9. The Lord God came to Cain and said, where is Abel your brother? What was his answer? I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? That response is a carnal response. What Cain is saying is, I don't care about my brother. All I care about is myself. Am I, am I my brother's keeper? Why, why should I worry about Abel? You see, that is ungodly. That, that is the heart of an unloving person. And, and maybe there are people that would say, well, hey, I'm saved. Man, what do I care about this other person? I, I, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be with God. Am I my brother's keeper? You know what the, the answer to that is for a believer? Yes, we are our brother's keeper. 
We should care about that person that is in our family or that friend or that neighbor or those kids at school that are lost. We are their keeper. We are to be a light to them. We are to show them the love of Christ. And we see that so practically lived out in Andrew. As a matter of fact, we, you know, we don't know a lot about Andrew. But you know, every time we see Andrew in the Bible, you know what he's doing? He's bringing others to Christ. He brought Simon Peter to Christ. Later, when Jesus was going to feed the 5,000, and, and Jesus said, you know, we're going to have food for these. And like, where are we going to get this food? It was Andrew who said, well, I know a little boy who's got a little lunch of fish and loaves. He brought that little boy to Jesus. Do you think that little boy who saw Jesus feed 5,000 with his fish, you think that little boy got saved? I bet he did. I bet we're going to see him in heaven. I bet Andrew brought him to Christ. And later, there were Greeks who were Gentiles that wanted to see Jesus. Philip said, well, these guys want to see Jesus. They're Greeks. He didn't know what to do. You know what Andrew did? He brought them to Jesus. And so, we may not know a lot about Andrew, but what we do know is this. His whole life he spent bringing others to Jesus. The greatest thing we can do. And by the way, the word Andrew, the name means manly. One of the most manly things we do is not be ashamed of the gospel. Tell others our testimony. Share with others the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul Little, in his wonderful little book, How to Give Away Your Faith, says, Witnessing is that deep-seated conviction that the greatest favor I can do for others is to introduce them to Jesus Christ. And I believe that with all my heart. You know what I've never met? I've never met a person who's genuinely saved, who's ever said to me, you know what, I wish I would have never given my life to Jesus Christ. I've never met that person. I've never met one. Every person that I have met genuinely saved will always say this, the greatest thing that ever happened to me was when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness? Is that the greatest thing that ever happened to you? Amen. And so when we share Christ with others, the greatest thing we can do for them is to share the gospel. Well, the last thing I want you to see with me is, is that we have to have a sincere willingness to share Christ. Are you willing? I mean, are you willing to share Christ with others? We see that uh, Jesus' early disciples, that they were willing and they were able. And, and so to, if we're willing, we have to have an intentional plan of action. The word intentional is, is key. Come in here with me. Many of us never witness to anybody because we're not intentional about it. And if we're ever going to become the witnesses that God wants us to be, we've got to make this intentional. We've got to be intentional about the Great Commission. When we talk about who's your one, what we're asking you to do is be intentional about thinking, God, who is someone in my sphere of influence that may not be saved, and I might be the one person that, that really cares about leading them to Christ. And so intentionally identifying that person. And, and then intentionality would involve beginning to pray for that person. Beginning to pray for God to make their hearts fertile so that we could plant the seed. God, pray that God would uh, begin to open their eyes. Pray that God would begin to convict them of their sin. We pray. And then we say, God, give me an opportunity. And we, we, we start working toward that opportunity by inviting them to breakfast, inviting them to lunch, inviting them to coffee. We build the bridge. We build that relationship. That's evangelism. That's witnessing, being intentional about building relationships, nurturing relationships, praying, have, being prepared with the gospel, having a card, a Bible with me. So that when that opportunity comes, I'm ready to share my testimony of the gospel. We need to have an intentional plan. We see that in Philip. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said, follow me. Philip immediately went and found his friend Nathaniel. Evidently, he cared about Nathaniel. And he said to him more than five words. So he goes a little bit more. Evidently, Nathaniel was a student of the Old Testament, steeped in Jewish tradition. And so he goes a little deeper. So he was prepared. 
And he said, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he was prepared. He was intentional. He knew exactly the kind of evangelistic approach to take with Nathaniel. And Nathaniel was very skeptical. <laughs> Nathaniel said, hey, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, come on, are you kidding me? There, that, uh, that can't be right. You're, I don't believe you. Nothing good comes out. Nazareth is a, a wicked, evil place. And I love how Philip responded. Not arguing, just loving, come and see. Just come and see. The Bible is full of that invitation. Just come and see. So Nathaniel came, and we'll see what happens in a minute. Uh, Johnny Hunt, the president of the North American Mission Board, shared this this recently, and, and this just breaks my heart. The, the statistic says that 20% of believers invite another believer to church. In other words, that's 80% of Christians who never even invite another believer to church. But 20% do. They, we invite believers. So in other words, if somebody moved next door to you and they, they, you met them and they said, hey, we're here, we're your neighbor, and we're, we've moved here from Virginia, and we, hey, we were in a Baptist church in Virginia, we're looking for a good Baptist church. <laughs> well, 20% of us would say, hey, you know, why don't you come, I go to North Park, why don't you come and go with me? 20% of us would do that. But here's the statistic that's heartbreaking. Only 2% of believers ever invite an unchurched or unsaved person to church. 98% of us, according to the statistic, never invite an unsaved or unchurched person. So if somebody moves next door and they're not in church and they're rough and they maybe use coarse language, the, the odds are that, well, that person you would never invite to church. And that is why we see our nation falling further and further away from God. We, we've got to be intentional uh, uh, about just to come and see. That may be the easiest invitation we can offer. And then the second thing is we must trust Christ with the results. When we share a witness for Jesus Christ, you and I are never responsible for the results. If you share Christ with someone and they reject it and they say, well, I don't believe anything good could come from that, that's not on you. Your only job is to share the good news of Jesus. Your job is not to try to coerce them to come to Christ. We have to trust him with the results. Nathaniel said, hey, I don't believe you. Nothing good could come. Well, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him, and Jesus said, behold, an Israelite... Indeed, in whom there is no deceit. In other words, Jesus said, hey, I like your honesty. You're an honest man. I, I appreciate that. There's no deceit in you. Well, Nathaniel even got more skeptical. He said, how do you know me? You don't know me. You, you've never met me. And then Jesus blows his socks off. Jesus said, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, when we look at his response in a minute, it's obvious Something was happening under that fig tree that Nathaniel, man, when Jesus said that, it rocked his world. So evidently, Nathaniel, a fig tree in those days was a shady place where many people read the Bible, read the, the Torah, the Old Testament. And it could be that Nathaniel was reading the law of the prophets about the coming Messiah. And Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. And then Nathaniel said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel and Jesus said, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You're going to see greater things than these. You haven't seen anything yet. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so even though Nathaniel appeared skeptical, God began to work. And, and it was the power of Jesus that drew Nathaniel to salvation. And listen. Every time you and I witness, it doesn't matter how that person responds. We planted a seed that God is going to begin to work in their life. And they may not be saved immediately, but it may be years down the road that they come to know Christ and they come back to you and they say, 
You know, you remember that time I cursed you out when you tried to witness to me? I never forgot what you said. And it just kept working in my life. And I eventually came to know Jesus because you had the courage to witness to me. We have to trust Christ with the results. The results aren't up to us. Our job is to merely be a witness. So, beloved, here's the point. There is great value in leading one person to Christ. So who is your one? I want you to begin to pray. Next Sunday, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about how to pray for that one. So I hope that all of you, your homework assignment this week is to ask God, who's my one? Who's that one person at school? Who's that one person in my family? Who's that one person in my neighborhood? And, and let God show you who your one is. And then next Sunday, we're going to talk about how do you pray for that one? And, and, and talk about how from, from then on, you know, how do we begin to build a relationship with that one and seek to lead them? My prayer to God for our church is, is that, that we would see a movement of just people like us, common people who, who, who are so in love with Jesus that we're just bringing others to Christ. I am weary in our, in our culture today of entertainment Christianity. You know, where it's all about the big lights, the big show, the big dance, and everybody flocks to a church, you know, because they got the professionals and all this. I'm like, God, that, that's not really what this thing is about. It, it's not about what happens up here. It was always meant to be what happened with the people that are saved. I, I long for a day here at North Park. We're always going to do a good job. We're going to study and prepare, but... but my prayer is it doesn't matter if I'm preaching, it doesn't matter if Ryan's preaching or Stephen's preaching or Josh is preaching, it doesn't matter if Chris is leading or Charlie's leading. All that matters is we are out there sharing our faith and bringing people into our life groups and our D groups into our services and leading them to Christ. And we're so excited about what God is doing that, that every Sunday we just worship God no matter who's on the stage, no matter what kind of thing happens, we are worshiping God because of the work that God is doing around us. That was what the New Testament church was like. They didn't have buildings. They didn't have all the, the, the things that we have. They were just a group of grassroots people that were in love with Jesus and sharing the gospel. And that is what we need to see in America today if we have hope to see revival. And it's got to begin with us. So who's your one and what's your plan? What is going to be your plan of action? We'll talk about that in the weeks ahead. You know, have you ever been on a picnic and you drop a cookie crumb on the picnic table? You've done that. Or a piece of meat. Can I tell you what happens? You know what happens. Just give it a few minutes and there's going to be a scout ant who's out scouting who's going to come across that crumb on that picnic table. Now, that scout ant could say, wow, man, I have struck the pot of gold. I am, I'm going to eat this thing all by myself. But that's never what he does, right? You watch that ant. He's going to make his way back down the t the, 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 uh, that picnic table. Uh, he's going to walk down it, and then he's going to go, and somehow he's going to communicate. I don't know how ants communicate, but he's going to tell the others about this crumb. And give it a little bit of time, and you're going to see a line of ants. <laughs> I mean, a whole line of them. And they're going to be all over that thing. Because that one ant tasted the sweetness of that crumb and said, this is too good to keep to myself. And he is bringing others to that sweet crumb. Beloved, I have tasted the sweetness of Christ. There's nothing sweeter in my life. And I pray that we would be like the ant, every one of us would be going. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 6, go to the ant and learn a lesson and be wise. Let's go to the ant and let's think about who our one is. And let's leave here and bring them to Jesus. Would you bow with me as we pray before God this morning? Maybe you're here and you say, well, Pastor, I don't think I've ever truly tasted the sweetness of Christ. I've heard about it. I've heard others share but I don't think I've ever been saved. Listen, this morning I want to invite you to taste of the sweetness of Christ. I invite you to come to Christ. I promise you there will be no greater decision that you would ever make. You say, well, how do I do it? 
Well, the Bible simply says, call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. So right there at your seat, you could say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm unworthy. I'm undeserving. But I realize today that Jesus died for my sins, was buried, rose again the third day. And I want to repent and believe and I want to be saved. And you will be saved. And my prayer is today that you would pray and call on the name of the Lord. I will be here. I'd love for you to come and let me pray for you. Or you can meet me out in the cafe right after this service. And I would love to pray with you. Some of you others may already know who your one is. God's already shown you. You already, maybe you want to come to the altar and begin praying over that one right now. God may be leading you to join our church. You could come to me or come see me in the cafe. Love for you. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Father, I pray you speak today. You're the God of the universe. Your Holy Spirit is in this room. And we pray, oh God, that you would draw people to your Son today, God. May there be somebody here today that is saved. God, may there be many believers here today that, God, you lay on our heart who our one is. And that we begin to develop a burden and a a plan of how we can lead that one to Christ. Oh God, move in our hearts today. Lead us to do in this time of worship and response. Lead us to do what you would have us do. In Jesus' name.